Hello guys, we're going to talk about the ultimate builds for the Dungeon of Nahelbuk Nightmare difficulty. They obviously work below that rank as well. Now, if you do enjoy yourselves, please remember to follow and subscribe. Let's get started. And the first on the chopping block is the Ranger, guys. And you have to remember, you are able to reset your characteristics in the game. This is very important because this means you can have, have like several builds ready and just kind of make some alterations as you progress through the game. So, first of all, the active and the passive skills. Uh, as you level up, I feel this is the first skill you should always pick up because this is just a lot of bonus healing and this just is something you always need to have uh, handy. Like every single character that can have a healing skill probably should because the early game is just brutal and that's just absolutely a no-brainer. Now this ability also is extremely potent but you kind of probably want to wait for this so you would pick this heavy armor here since we are going melee ranger here and that's quite good. Now, this is something that unlocks, uh, so that's we're like, well, level 3 now. Level 3, you have two possibilities. You can either take the Tactic Protection or Tactic Tortoise Formation. When you are low level, up until level 4 or 5, you really do not need the magical and physical resistances. There are so few status effects that you'll never even notice them being there. Now, if you do take this one, this one however, this is 2 protection across the board permanently for the duration of the fight. You're reducing a lot of damage using this. So this is basically just very important while your HP is very low and the damage is respectably low as well. So we're just going to go for this uh, formation first. Once you are about level 5 or 6, you go for this. So this is going to be the end build where I take this. This I have really not been using this that much because just having this extra defense, you know, 10 parry, 10 dodge uh, and 2 protection, all those extra resistances just goes extremely long way. Now, when you are here, you have quite a few options. I actually enjoy having First Blood now, because First Blood is extremely potent in terms of just doing damage. It does double damage on targets with full HP. You are very high on courage, generally speaking, as a ranger. You have 15 baseline courage, which is just extremely high, so you can actually just play around this quite a lot. I'm gonna take this, you always get to use it at least once or twice in the fight. It's a lot of damage, you can like do at the end game you do like 100 something damage, that's quite decent for a basic skill on a character that's just mostly a uh, melee support. Now, from there, uh, you can use shields and get parry, this is super important, like you need to survive. Ranger has very low baseline HP, so you just need to get something to kind of support that a little bit. Then, I believe that, that what's right is just kind of unlocking this part of the tree first. Uh, what we do is we pick either the first aid that removes knockdown or stun, or first aid that removes burning and poison. I think this is better specifically because we do have this, so you're not maybe not unlikely, but less likely to get actually knocked over or stunned, and I feel like this is just a better option uh, here for healing. And from here, we're actually able to get the second bonus, this is plus 5 parry, uh, those are not stacking, right? See, this is just plus 10 total, this is still good enough. Now you have a choice between melee and uh, ranged, I go melee here. I tried the ranger playing, you know, the bows and such, it was not that great. So I just decided this is the better choice here. We go for shield bash then, and this is basically our core build for the ranger. Now you have quite a few options here. I feel like this is a very good late game investment. Like this is not that great level one, but once you are able to get to this tier here, it just becomes ridiculously powerful. So now we have another, quite, quite a few unlocks actually available once again. So first of all, you can actually get like this. Plus 2 courage, plus 2 strength until the end of combat for every enemy you kill, but that's not that common that you kill someone. So I feel like it's up to you here, like there are quite a few flavors if you play like in close ranks with a lot of allies. This is very solid. That goes up to 20% damage, very very decent choice. I guess like that's the burst stats here, like you have quite a few, you have 5 points to spend and you will be spending them on some of those skills. I would probably just go like pure stats, pure stats, get this. And then from there you can just kind of try evolving up. Now, uh, as far as these skills, you really want to max this one out because this is plus to move and plus 15 precision once you reach level 8, I think, which is very, very solid. I would always get this. This is one of the most powerful builds in the game. Then, like, you get, like, a lot of precision from this. It lasts a lot. I mean, this is one of the most powerful uh, buffs in the game. To move and 15 precision, there's a lot of flexibility across the board. Also facilitates a lot of your, your lower accuracy characters. So very, very decent stuff overall. Shield bash level 2 and you're done with the actives. You really don't need these skills, like they are not that great at all. Uh, you could potentially try using the bows, but really I feel like what Ranger is good at is just kind of sticking uh, into this front line, just kind of doing his thing. Now uh, I, I went this way, I just kind of think I figured uh, this was a, this was going to be the best uh, possible setup. And this is just what worked for me the best, right? So you have like a lot of agility and strength bonuses here. Uh, what you really want to do then is kind of pick up some um, resilience as well as so you probably want to go like at first, like, I would just be going, like, 1-1, one, one, Agility and Constitution, just because you want to have, like, maximum precision you can get. Early on, 
actually your precision is quite low, so you'll just go like 1-1-1-1. One, 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 one. Once you start getting the third point on the ranger, because at some point, I think at level 5, you start getting the third point, you start just going 1-1-1-1-1-1, uh, one, uh, one, 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 right? So you kind of start pumping some points into the constitution, and this is basically how it goes, right? So you probably just kind of spend your points like 1-1 one, one first into agility and strength, until level 5 and you just start adding extra points into the constitution until you're done. I think at level 8 you start getting additional points as well, so this is how it goes. I think this is like basically the solid start distribution and this just allows you to basically manage most of the content in the game using the ranger with obviously uh, as a main support for the team because he's your core support character. He is a leader as it is said and he just does what leaders do best, he just casts the buffs he does the healing, he stuns, and he occasionally just gets the first blood damage, and that's basically what the ranger is for. Uh, you have to remember this one actually does uh, give you bonus damage when your enemies are full HP as well, so you may actually have to choose between these two. So depending on whether you go for utility or for um, or for uh, for damage, right? That's kind of the major choice you might have. Over time, guys, I haven't said this before, but there are certain abilities in this game that are guaranteed to hit. Like they are just not going to, it's not going to be possible for your opponents to dodge them in any way or form. And one of them is the burps. This is a guaranteed 100% stun, one of the most useful abilities early on into the game, you have to take it first. Now if you go into this, uh, kind of this line, this train of thought, you have quite a few of those abilities on your other characters, such as for instance the Ferocious Pounce. This charge ability always does hit as well. Uh, the cow drops, the uh, blinding powder on your thief. I think Ricochet might be one of them, I'm not really confident about this though, not 100% sure. Uh, uh, as far as this, I think that I think the, the Welling Wallop is also going to hit every single time. So those abilities very powerful, like, kind of can hit uh, every single time on those very high dodge characters. Such as this like, J-Pack whom, we'll, whom you will be fighting later, it's a very good idea, it's a very good idea to just pick them up very soon. Now, as far as passive skills, you need to take these two first, because you just allow yourself to open up a lot of passages allows you to kind of get a lot of treasure, kind of become more powerful, very useful just take the breach early on. You may actually want to kind of, if you start carrying the reset potions, you, if you want to kind of max your character out, you might kind of give up on this, right? Probably not the best idea to kind of keep them lying around, but at the very early stages of the game, probably a good idea to have them both from the get-go, just allows you to do a lot of things, right? So probably I would always go with this. Now, you are hitting this point here of the Ogre now, this is very powerful attack, gives you, obviously very inaccurate, so you have to kind of invest in the agility to be hitting this, but this gives you a lot of damage, 120% AoE in a line, ridiculously strong stuff, I would always go with this. Now, this is something you might want to take, but not too soon, because you do not unlock a hammer early on, and the hammer, like, I think you get like a very basic one that doesn't really have like a big advantage over bare fists, so uh, until that point, you, I think that until you get like a blue hammer looted, you really shouldn't be getting this, uh, there's really no point there. I'd go with this, like plus one physical resistance per level, maybe resistance isn't the best, but this is just the best talent you can pick up at this point, that's, that's basically the reason why I did this. And then you can probably just kind of think of doing something here, so this reveals all stealthy targets and also inflicts penalty to dodge to precision, I really didn't use this much. So I would say this is not the best, probably taking this isn't that bad because this actually gives you a bit of a knockdown, Pretty solid stuff, just get yourself a little bit of CC, pretty useful overall. Now when you get to this point, so level 5 I believe, you unlock the most powerful ability the Ogre has, and this is the Dwarf Throw. You can throw your Dwarf very far away, doing a lot of AoE, just repositioning your tank as well, allowing him to actually land his AoE ability. In the meantime, it's just extremely potent, you should always go with this first. This would be a bread and butter ability, like this is something you should be basically building your setup, like the initial turn one setup around. Because this is always going to hit as well, just like burps, it's just guaranteed to do a lot of damage. So now, you can go for either the poison here or just go for the very big AoE on burps, I think this is okay actually to go with this. I would just prefer to go for uh, this 80% bonus damage first, just because this allows you to kind of dish out a lot of damage using the ogre. Now, uh, this again, not bad, plus 2 physical, like additional resistance per level, this, is, this gives you like up to 70 fizz rest total, very very high stats. Uh, on your ogre and your max out, so very decent, uh, good idea to pick it up. Now, at this point you should have enough precision to actually warrant taking this. This plus an impact minus 5 precision, you can actually make up for this just investing into uh, agility, so you can just over invest into agility, just taking you know, the, you take the, what, 3 points into agility, this is worth like 10 points of strength. It's extremely good, like this is just kind of mathematically solid, because you can balance it out using your stats, and you just get a lot out of this, so this kind of allows you to kind of minimax your character a little bit at least. 
This is plasma movement, obviously something you should always go for as well. Plasma, maybe even over this. This just gives you a lot of mobility, a lot of setup. Again, when you get the ability to unlock this one, a very good idea to take it as well. Uh, uh, as far as kind of going down the, tree, down the tree right now, probably a good idea to just pick up strength here. I really don't think you need any other of those. Okay, at this point you should probably be, ha have this unlocked as well, right? So uh, this uh, 200 hammer ability, actually hammers become extremely good later on. And they probably are the only item that you want to be using in the Ogre as a weapon. So uh, I just take it like around level 7, level 6. I think that's the point at which you get the blue weapons first. So then you probably just kind of want to pick up uh, what well, bonus strength, I guess, doesn't really hurt you that much. Protection, you really do not need protection if you're on the Ogre. He's so beefy that, you know, plus two protection doesn't quite kind of go uh, uh, that far for you. And you just have so many other priorities that this kind of might feel like a waste. Obviously, if you do carry your reset potions, uh, you can just kind of use the, you know, remove the Ogre Breach. Just min max, maybe take the bonus impact here with the Barbarian and then just pick up, pick up the Ogre skin one can work as well. You know, you have quite a few choices here, honestly. I don't think Gume is good. It wastes your first turn to kind of eat any sort of food, and this doesn't kind of scale for you that well, because you just keep doing damage with the Ogre anyway. You don't need this that much, okay? Uh, so as far as uh, your uh, actives go, always take Dwarf Throw then. Uh, and then you probably have a lot of time to actually pick up something else. You can go for like AoE Burbs. You can just go for this, Savage Tremors. And then you can either go for CC or for bonus AOE. Actually, I, I went for damage a for bonus AOE. This didn't work that well. I went for I would go for Tremors here and go for AOE burps, and this basically solves the ogre. Now, as far as your bonuses to stats go, you need to start investing into agility first, because you'll be using basic attacks a lot early. And this just means that you need to kind of add at least six point early six points early on into your agility just to improve your precision by at least a little bit. Once you get this. You can start kind of maybe making some uh, pivots into constitution as well. So kind of you go, you know, you went like what six points into this. Then you might start going one, 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 uh, and then like once you get like to the three point break that break point, breaking point, then you start going one, one, one all together across those uh, abilities. Maybe even just trying to maximize your constitution at some point. This should be kind of the the way you do it anyway. Just go one, one for like good. Three levels into agility, then start kind of pivoting into constitution. When you get like three points per level, you just kind of go one one from there. You should be okay, because also those high accuracy buffs will start kicking in, you know. And at this point, and you will just get a lot of accuracy from Lube's anticipation. This means that your ogre is going to be hitting most of his targets anyway. This being said, you also will be using a lot of uh, the throw and a lot of burps, which means you will be doing a lot of guaranteed damage. That's basically how it is. Guys, now the Dwarf, and the Dwarf has some issues. He's not the best character in the game, definitely. He's a very slow tank, but he really doesn't go outside of the tank role. And honestly, the taunt isn't guaranteed to actually attract enemies towards you, so the Dwarven insult isn't as effective as it would seem. Uh, this being said, he is a very solid frontliner, so you just might kind of want to use him like as, as, as that role exactly. And what we'll be doing here first is we'll be taking the Wellwind and the Tin Can. I feel Tin Can might be just a better choice here overall, simply because it provides a lot of utility. Plus 50 parry is a very solid buff. This allows you to crit parry a lot. It just allows you to parry just basically parry uh, as well. So this it kind of allows you to negate a lot of incoming damage. One of the most powerful skills in the game, like this and the Paladins, a parry buff are probably the most powerful abilities you can have in the early game anyhow. So this is what you want to fire up on the very first turn, and you kind of go from there. So the Dwarf does, come, does become useful in the combination of the Ogre later on, but we'll kind of talk about this when we get to the Ogre build. This being said, you, you know, your Dwarf is going to be mostly utility and disruption. So we go for the Whirling Wallop, and from here, I would say you should always go for uh, the Stun here. This is very useful. You can stun up to all, uh, probably like four or five characters usually, if you set yourself up properly. And this is a very, very solid set. I would always go this way first. Uh, and then you have quite a few choices really, like you could go for this, you could go like for the Wolven and Insult, or you can just kind of go, uh, wait for it, like get some po some passive points first, unlock this part of the tree and maybe just go in to get uh, this ability here. Uh, it just does wonders for you as well. However, like you have to remember like the Dwarf's Kit isn't the most powerful in the world. You just have to remember like those, are, those basic skills are probably w what you'll be using for the majority of the game. Right, so you have to remember like these are the baseline and you should always get these and from there it's basically up to you now we're gonna go for the passive so max hp per level very useful so you should probably go for this first just kind of get some extra survivability 
Now, I would say uh, I would say this is probably a decent choice, but you want to go into it later. So you have quite a few choices. You can actually go for this right away. Like you can just get the points here just to unlock the lower point of the tree, like lower part of the tree, which gives you some more CC because your dwarf is going to be this kind of CC. But you're going for this additional stun really goes a long way in those fights. Like especially like in the mid game where it's very hard still, and you need everything that you can squeeze out of your character. So we're gonna go for this. Um, now, plus 20 max stamina, actually the Dwarf does run out of stamina quite a lot, so this is a good choice overall. Uh, I would be going for uh, for the Shield Expert and the max stamina here. Uh, you can potentially just decide on one of these already, like when you are like level 5 or so, you can start picking up some resistances. I would go for this because you do have very high Fizz resistance as it is. Your Magical resistance is usually quite a bit lower, since you know you go usually you usually get like some uh, Fizz rest from Constitution, and that's just kind of the base thing that, that you get, right? So I would just raise my magical resistance here using this ability. Now uh, you can start picking up some other things here. Uh, so this uh, this can be useful actually. You can actually get your allies up. Uh, this is quite quite decent. Uh, but uh, I, I actually wasn't using, using it that much. So I, I opted out of it eventually. So I'm gonna go for max stamina here. We get the uh, stun chance here. This is the most important ability from this row here. Uh, and then you can actually just pick whatever you want. So you have um, basically quite a few ba simple choices like this plus way parry. You know, parry is a very important stat, so you, can, you just want to stack as much of it as you can. Uh, I would go for maybe even strength here since it's, like, it's a free statistic, really. I barely was using the defensive stance after like the very early stages of the game, so I don't think this is the best choice in the world either. So now, as I can, kind of a lot of dwarven abilities are just uh, underwhelming at best. You could go for this because this allows you to salvage your allies. Uh, you know, basically can save the barbarian like some other high damage dealer, just allow it allow them to act instead of the dwarf. Which means I, I guess this is not that bad. I would probably just go with this. Uh, I went for insult, but it wasn't that great. I actually tried these abilities as well. Not necessarily the best, because in this case you have to have a lot of support. And this just doesn't even do that much damage, because Dwarf isn't going to go for strength. Um, now I'm going to go with stamina here, and I'm going to go with the maximum parry plus 8. That's very decent, uh, decent total. And then you absolutely have to take one of those. Uh, this one is the AoE version of Knockdown. So you have AoE CC, that's the most important thing in the world. And then you can choose, actually. You have quite a few things you can actually pick in here. You can go for the charge, which does a lot of damage. You can go for this. I actually never had the opportunity to use it, even though I picked it up. Uh, I, I guess it's probably best for you to just go for, uh, for like, either some sort of engagement here or just Wolf and Insult. I, I just I just went Insult. I really didn't regret it that much. So maybe you, you might want to debuff protection of your enemies just so that you know your thief can spike them down with his very powerful melee attacks. And this might be the way to do it. So probably this is not the worst uh, situation. Also, you can just take this, you know, take take an additional bit of CC, just scare your opponents. Means they'll be just running from you uh, when, when they're scared. That's not a bad option at all, but always delay this for the last. These abilities are, maybe they look okay, but they're kind of useless, I feel. So I would never go that way. Now, for stats. Again, uh, agility constitution until you get to the break point where you start getting three points per level. And then you start adding uh, some strength as well. Uh, you can actually just omit strength and just go full, you know, just go to constitution, one agility, I think. The dwarf isn't going to be doing damage for you, so this might even be better, like, just go one, two, one, two, one, and until you're done, right? Because uh, your core uh, is going to be the constitution, you're going to, you're just going to be a very, very tanky beast. Uh, agility gives you a lot because it actually allows you to get bonus precision, but also parry, which is extremely vital for a tank, right? So you can get up to incredibly high parry numbers just using the base stats with this uh, with this way of adding, distributing the stats. And obviously whenever something goes through, it will just kind of hit this ridiculously high HP uh, bar of your character. So that's why we're going for constitution as well. So that's, that's basically how it goes. You should be at around 500 HP at level 10 is just extremely good. I did invest, like when I was playing, I did invest some points in strength, but I really don't think I, you need the strength. You really just want to kind of have this tank in the front, just soaking up the damage, just surviving as long as humanly possible. And guys, this is it for the Dwarf. Guys, Elf time now. Elf is a very powerful ranged damage dealer, but what she does as well is support. 
basically, she supports with healing. So I'd always go with the healing ability first, since you get one shot a lot in Nightmare, maybe in the lower difficulties as well. So this is kind of something that will allow you to keep your team alive. It is a seven range heal, probably the longest range heal in the game, other than the Wizardess and the Priestess. It allows you to just keep your guys alive and going, especially the Elf doesn't quite have that much damage early on. So this is a nice way of spending your turn, just keeping your allies HP decently high uh, to kind of survive, right? So that's definitely a very good pick number one. Now, you probably don't want to go into Longshot instantaneously because what you want is to get the Ricochet to level two. And the way you accomplish this is just by, is just by getting one of those bonuses over here. I would just go with plus five precision. This also allows you to distribute all your stats into strength early on. This accuracy bonus is ridiculously powerful. So it would definitely go for that. Now, uh, when you get here, uh, this is the best passive you can get because every time your elf is melee, she can just dodge out and just use ranged attacks freely using Swift Footed. Now, when you go to the ricochet, you see that there are two ricochets available. This one bounces four times, but can hit your allies. You really do not want to be hitting your allies in this game because really you have so little health points as it is that just, you know, bending the rules and just hitting your allies even more just is going to be very, very bad. So we're going to avoid this. We just go for this ability here. We take the elven ricochet. And at that point, you might actually want to start thinking of taking the long shot to snipe away the enemy ranked character. So I would just go for this and you can actually leave it like this. I went for the immobilize here. This is kind of useful against certain enemies. You can obviously just go for this kind of powerful long shot as well. Both these options work. Uh, I chose Immobilize because it just a little bit of CC kind of takes the weight off some character's shoulders. But you can easily just go for this high damage long shot just kind of to make this your core damaging ability until the point you get one shot, one kill later on in the game. Now, so let's say you go for, you go my way, so you go like this. Now, this unlocks a lot of abilities here, but you really don't want them first. I would always say cheering because, you know, taking protection with healing, 65 healing base, very solid ability. I would just always go with this first. Now you have quite a few choices, so you can go with the Unlikely Strike or the second tier of healing. Both of them really work. This one allows you, if you go into melee, to actually finish up your enemies. This is probably the most powerful heal you may have in uh, this party if you don't have the priestess, priestess. So this is a very, very powerful skill as well. You eventually end up taking both these anyway, so it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, now, plus high accuracy, uh, and you have no uh, penalties for shooting and uh, long ranges. This is very good, like, so this basically just allows you to get quite a few bonuses here. And again, you, you can have two choices here. First of all, a standard attack does 10% more damage. Uh, now, this this one in this case, you're getting plus 10 precision and also higher chance of collateral damage. I actually kind of, I think, hesitated on this. I think eventually you just might want to take this additional damage here. What I did though, I took this one instantaneously. This is plus one maximum range. Very important to just have it. It just gives you a lot of stats. Now this very bottom line stats for the elf are really underwhelming. So you probably don't even want to delve into them too much. Maybe taking the agility, sorry, the dodge bonus later. We really don't want to be getting this, these too soon. So what I did later is I, I just took impact. I went for either of these. I think both of them pretty decent overall. This is plus and precision for the standard attack. Actually, no, this is not bad, not, not good at all. I'm just gonna go with this because you don't really use your standard attacks that much. Now, I always take this and this means that you want to get some extra precision for agility because this one has extra debuff to precision on uh, on shot. So you obviously can get this up using your uh, ranger at this point, using the movement buff that gives you 15 precision and the barbarian's cry. So you can actually get over this uh, and this is why I would always suggest you go for this, because if you buff those two characters and then you use the elf to just deliver this one shot, one kill, it will very often just be that. It will just do like 150, 160 damage, very nice opener, no preparation really needed because you'd be using those abilities anyway, and this basically closes up the build here. Uh, what I would do is, like, I would avoid taking buffs here because they are not that great, really not that great at all. Uh, they just don't give you that much, right? Strength, agil agility, and courage, sure, decent stats overall, but you just kind of waste your turn with the elf, and elf can do so much in the uh, at the very start of the fight, so you, you just want to kind of maximize the efficiency of your cooldowns first, and then think about doing other things, right? So what I did later, I have like three passive points, as you can see, I think I just went for uh, dodge, and then I just kind of added additional charisma. This improves your healing by a bit. This is plus six charisma You really don't have to spend any points on and those bonuses are overall like just very very underwhelming like, Adjacent to dwarf very very rarely does it happen. Cower is not that great and overwatch in this game Not exactly what I would expect from overwatch overall. It's kind of underwhelming as well So I never used it really 
Uh, I tried that your, the AI is so good at disarming overwatches that it just doesn't make that much sense, guys. This being said, uh, as far as stats go, I just went like full all in on strength at first. I think I added like the first eight or so points into strength, uh, maybe even 10. And then I started going one, two, or even one, one. Uh, like kind of, you want to keep this balance, right? But you generally speaking, I want to have as high impact on the elf as possible because her base stats, like her base damage with the basic attacks, because her weapons just have low damage, is low as well. So you just want to kind of maximize your damage, especially that you have a lot of accuracy coming from multiple sources, right? So you kind of go two to one, eventually getting like quite a lot of strength here. This is what I kind of would advise you to end up with. And this being said, this is elf, guys. This is elf. Okay, guys, now the most underwhelming character on the team initially. Because the thief does become extremely potent later on. This mostly relies on very aggressive itemization though, so we'll talk about this later. But this actually has to begin with a very small preface. Your thief is going to suck out. <laughs> There's no way around this. He's just not going to be that good. Uh, but you can actually make him work as you kind of invest your points correctly and you kind of think about the bonus you can get. Now, we are going for this first. You really want to have the Bomberman here, and you really want to have both these passives. Right? This gives you a lot of damage overall, so I'm just going to click this one here. Get the Stealth, because initially you just want to be using Stealth early to just kind of maximize your damage output. Uh, honestly, the Sneaky Strike is not that great. Um, I mean, it's great on its own. You don't need either of those. I actually went with Immobilize, but Poison does maximize your damage by quite a bit. So if you feel like this is a way to go for you, you know, Poison kind of ticks more and more with every single turn. So, like, if you do... It does like 10 damage first, then it does like 20, 30, and so on and so forth. So it does actually kind of improve over time. Obviously also relies on the maximum HP of your enemy, so if you're focusing a boss, this ability, if it can actually land a poison, does a lot of damage. This however means that if you go for like a sneaky attack on an archer, uh, this actually mobilizes them, so they cannot escape your grasp, they'll have to just stay in melee and deal with you. So I always went with this, but I can see people going with this as well. Right? This, there are quite decent options overall. Now, the passives always go with this whenever you get the opportunity to unlock it. This is the most powerful ability for the thief. This means a lot of bombs actually go AoE. So, notably, Ice Bomb becomes AoE, which means that your Ice Bomb will be doing AoE damage and also will be freezing in a 3 by 3 AoE. It is better than the uh, than the AoE spell of the wizard is because this is a 100% chance baseline to freeze. Obviously, this can be resisted still, but it's probably like the best reliable form of CC you will have in the game up until like level 6. So obviously those bombs are limited, so you have to be careful about using them, but this is just so so good for those very difficult boss fights. You can, you know, in the golden fight, you can freeze multiple goblins at the same time, just open up a lot of space for yourself, right? This is a very very good uh, uh, bonus and you always should be using this. Really very strong stuff. Now, going from here, I would take Caltrops anyway, this is Immobilize, this is something that just gives you a little bit of wiggle room in those fights, very very decent ability overall. Now, I would go for uh, Crit Chance again here, uh, because you just want, need to be isolated, this is the only thing you need to be doing. If you're isolated, this is ridiculously good. There's no other way to put it, it's just so strong. Now, you go for Crit Multiplier here, gives you additional 75% uh, bonus damage from Crit Strikes together with this. Excuse me, so it's just overall very, very strong. I would always go this way. Now, we have uh, additional bonuses here when the target is suffering from the status effects. I would just kind of avoid this. I would just go for this kind of confident crit bonuses across the board. Now, this is quite good, okay? So we could probably just take this later, but I, I would always just advertise or advise you to go towards the uh, the crit bonuses. So quite a few of those things are available to you, as, I, as you can see here. Uh, you can actually try going this way, but I would just say this is kind of the most confident thing you can do. Just go full all in on crits, you will not regret it. Once you start getting towards the end um, of the line here, you'll just start getting a lot of bonuses. Now you can notice that this unlocks uh, my Nervous Burst, which I take. And Cowardly Finish. Those are very important skills. You want to have like 100% damage on the Cowardly Finish. This could be okay because this is a ranged skill, right? This kind of gives you a free action point and a finisher. But this just get guarantees that you kill all, most of the time. So this is this is very powerful. Now you will have a lot of precision, so you can actually go for the quadruple nervous burst. It will very often connect, and this just does a lot of damage overall. So I'd go for this one here. So you just go for the improved uh, nervous burst as soon as you can. This can attack up to four times. I have seen this ability do about 400, 500 damage alone. So it's crazy good. It's ridiculously good actually. And I would just go for this. Uh, 
Mood Callus, Blinding Powder. I really don't like Crippling Shot that much. I don't think it's that strong. Uh, even at the very, very long range, you know, you're not that accurate with the crossbow as a thief, so usually I would avoid this. We take this, just kind of bonus precision, not nothing really to scuff at, right? You could potentially try getting into this, but this is just far, far less reliable. And finally, uh, obviously this is not that bad early on, actually. If you, if you want to kind of reset out of this, you can take this and reset out of it later, because your sneaky strike will actually facilitate this a lot, because you do immobilize. And then you just kind of do bonus 50% damage with a follow-up basic attack, which you probably will be doing. Um, right, so that's kind of what you might want to do as well. Then reset out of this for this more reliable path over here. Uh, I would just always do this. And then finally, you either can take this very high AoE minus 20 precision debuff, which is which comes very late and really does not matter that much. I would just go for this, this kind of AoE poison that's kind of decent. You kind of you know walk into a very large number of enemies. It just does uh, work very well. Your thief is going to be a glass cannon. This is why we go one, 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 one all the time until we reach the point where we have like four points, to, uh, three points per level to spend, and then we start to, start going two, one, two, one, two, one. Uh, at some point, we do get to the uh, to the break point where we get four levels, four points per level. That's when we start going two, two. I, I feel like this is the most uh, reliable way of doing this. So you kind of want to end up with a very high agility and strength. Agility gives you dodge. And obviously precision, whereas strength just gives you just gives you a bunch of impact. You really want to have like maximized damage on the thief. You cannot afford to play, uh, you know, like defensive with the character. You just have to kind of all in because that's the style this character uses. So you really need to have this very very high strength bonus and very high agility as well, just to facilitate all your kit. Now going into your inventory. You might notice they have a lot of crit chance here. This means that I'm just getting a lot of critical strikes overall. This is very powerful. You also want to have like maximized movement, right? This means that you can actually move in position and just do your damage. That's kind of what you what you're about uh, as a thief. And you might want to start using the uh, you know maybe even use a triple slot. But this one is actually extremely good for the thief, by the way. Plus two movement and plus one sprint. Really solid stuff. Uh, if you can get this one, I think this is about chapter seven. So up until that point, like you probably just want to have like a triple slot belt overall just to facilitate your bombs. At that point, then you just kind of can go for this because this allows you to get like a lot of nice setups with the thief. Just reach the backline within a single turn and just deliver shitloads of damage. This is what the thief is about. So this is it for the thief, guys. Barbarian time, guys. Barbarian time. And Barbarian is my favorite character, I think. He looks super weak early on because he, his accuracy just sucks. So what you want to do at the very first, like the very first thing you might want to be doing is just maximize your accuracy, your precision. So what you do is you start by pumping out of agility into your points, like probably the first three levels will be agility focused and you just go with the flow. Now, you definitely want to have this because this allows you to wear heavy leather armor, just gives you a lot of bonuses. These two aren't that great because this is again plus by stamina, not really regen, that's not really that great. You don't want to be kind of adjacent to the ogre anyway most of the time. And finally, here we're never next to the uh, Wizardess. You should not be investing into ranged with the Barbarian because you will never be using ranged attacks. He's so powerful in melee, ranged is just a huge waste of time and effort. Yark is the most powerful attack you will have early on, so I'll just strongly advise you. This is like a single target destruction. You go for these two, you just go Yark and Yark, and that's how it's done. Now, this being said, uh, once you are done with these two abilities, you definitely want to start investing into the Savage War Cry here. Just take this one and then eventually follow it up with the Steel, steel Barrage here. 130% baseline AOD, uh, sorry, 130% base damage, AOE, very solid stuff. Now, when you are here, you actually may wonder what you do. Like, you probably want to skip this because you are just, you have done all the important bits. Uh, as far as this, we have like four points to spend. We should be able to reach this ability and this ability later on. So we, we kind of want to unlock Ferocious Pounds next. You probably don't want to be taking any of these skills. I really don't find them that, that strong. Like Rip Crush at 20% base damage is just a huge waste. Because your base damage is ridiculously high on the Barbarian. You really do not want to be kind of wasting your points on, you know, 20 or even 80% damaging attack. There is just, this is not the way to go with the Barbarian, guys. So what you want to do is kind of maximize the precision. You get this. Plus 10 precision, very powerful from the get-go, right? Now, you will start running out of stamina eventually. So when you do, you probably want to start taking this, these points here. Uh, in the meantime, Tavga is very good because you're never weakened. And then you can either take bonus impact, which gives you more damage, or just go for this. I went with this because this is just bonus protection below 50% HP. It means you're very, very hard to take down. 
And you have decent HP as a Barbarian, right? So you kind of benefit from this quite a lot. Uh, I didn't go for the crit path here. I know you can do this, but I actually was running out of stamina at this point, so I just went for a single Chrom's Guts here. Now, you can actually go for crits if you really want to, but I just feel like the base damage is just so powerful in the Barbarian, there is no need to go for crits. Uh, so what I did is I actually went for like those. I unlocked Ferocious Pounce, pounce I, unlocked, I unlocked the Brawn, and what I did later is I probably went for the base statistics, statistics here like this and this. This gives you a lot of defenses. This is plus one movement. It's kind of locked behind plus two sprint, which you really don't need that much since you have very high engagement uh, available right now with this. There are quite a few uh, schools of thought on this one. You can go for a stun AoE. You can go for damage AoE. You can go for uh, protection AoE. Now, I, I feel like this is just 150% AoE. You can hit like four characters with this. This is so powerful. There's just really this is the best ability you can pick. And then if you have like good setup here, if you can get a lot of coverage on your Barbarian, which is very easy for gear, you can actually set up this one very easily. I'm gonna talk about this later when I will be talking about the, the Paladin, so those channeled skills actually are easy to set up if you know what you're doing. I'll tell you about this when we get to the Paladin uh, later on down the line. Now the stats. Uh, first few levels, I would just always go for agility up until we get like 20. Then you can start kind of splitting this uh, between these three stats, right? Uh, so when we get here, you can start like going 1 1 1 really, 1 1 1, like up until you're done. That's basically the trick here. The Barbarian doesn't really need anything else but these three base stats. You really need all of them though, like you probably want to have like about this, uh, this kind of uh, lineup in the end. Gives you a lot of precision, gives you a lot of impact, a lot of HP, everything that the Barbarian needs. Like you need some survivability, you cannot go full glass cannon because Barbarian is in the thick of things, right? So you, can, you have to invest some into Constitution at least. Obviously, bonus parry from agility also goes a long way. And this is basically it for the Barbarian, guys. Do not go, I, I didn't go crit, I didn't feel the need to do this, because his base damage is just ridiculously high as it is. You don't need it that much. And yeah, let's move on to the Ogre. Okay, now the Wizardess. Wizardess is my favorite character. She's probably the most powerful member of the party. And she just does a lot of things for your party as well. She has a lot of AoE, she has a lot of like guaranteed hits as well on her, or her abilities. She just does so much overall. And what you should be doing with the Wizardess is actually just making sure that her guaranteed abilities just do as well as humanly possible. She has the synergy of the Ogre, not the best thing to kind of invest in, so you probably want to kind of take it out as soon as, as you can and just go into perhaps like Astral Energy region early on just so that you have like always, so that you always have the ability to use your mana. I would always go like this because this kind of unlocks you useful abilities later. I think the Namzer Slap, highly inaccurate early on, not that useful later as well. I feel like there are better abilities you can take, so you can just kind of avoid taking this at all. Also, Global Thorns, I would say not the best skill in the world. Really, you can have like a lot of impact on, on your character not using these two abilities altogether. So I just I would just go like this. So you reset uh, when you can, you go like this, so you go like extra and en astral energy on both. And this means you can unlock either the bunny or the AoE stun. I'd go with this because this just does, you No, know, you give up some damage, but it actually does so much for your stun. It's such a powerful mechanic, really goes a long way. Now you do unlock the bonus range to the spells you take it from the get-go. This is plus two bonus range, really powerful. Probably the best passive you have on the wizard desk, really goes a long way as well. Now. At this point, take the bunny, this gives you mana regeneration and also gives you a lot of damage. Reliable, this is another, another skill that you cannot miss, so very good idea to just pick it up. Uh, and at this point, you probably just kind of want to uh, take a second level of heal, because this kind of gives you a lot of healing, that's always good. And from here, it's really quite a, there are quite a few paths. You can go for CC, this is guaranteed to freeze. Uh, it can be dodged though, right? So this can become an AoE freeze again. Right, so this is uh, this is kind of an okay idea. I can go for like this AOE freeze. Uh, that's that's not terrible, right? This is, this is just not not bad. So you can hit like three targets, freeze them. Doesn't sound that bad. This, however, does a lot of damage. So I feel like my wizardess. I felt like my wizardess kind of needed the damage first. I went for major fireball. Uh, then I kind of invested into the bunny because you just want to kind of optimize your damage output. This is kind of what does it. So I just went for the killer bunny too. Uh, I invested into my uh, astral energy region. And I invested into my Astral Energy Pool as well. This is actually because I wanted to maximize uh, my mana just to never suffer from this issue ever again. Now, when you unlock this, is pro this ability, this is probably your most powerful skill you can have. Uh, so I would always go for the Hectic Hailstorm because this can be evolved. Actually, this, is, this might be better early on 
but this can be evolved, this ability can be involved into the Hailstorm, which actually has the best AoE freeze in the game. It does so much damage as well, it's just super, super potent altogether. So always go that way. Extremely, uh, extremely potent and just does a lot for you in a long run. Uh, if you do not like the Fireball, you can obviously just kind of spec out of this, take the spread here. Uh, but you have to remember this works the way the Ricochet does, actually can also freeze your allies. Probably not the best idea then in the world, but if you're feeling like kind of if you're feeling frisky, you can do it as well. Now I went for the high damage here. I really like single target damage in this game because this means you can focus down your enemies very quickly, like one by one. This means you kind of minimize the damage output they have per turn if you can just kind of snipe them off one by one. So this is probably something I went for. Uh, I would go for again as well. If you really want, you can go for like Ice Bolt and then take this as well. This actually doesn't burn. This actually does a lot of damage though and actually moves at the protection too and freezes, which is a decent form of CC. So you can definitely go this way as well. It's entirely up to you. I really like the Fireball, like 200% base damage, right? Just something I really wanted to have on my character here and I did in the end, right? So I would, I would always uh, take this path here. Now, 5% crit fail doesn't sound like a lot, but it's just going to make your life so difficult and just kind of go into the way of every single plan you have. So you'd always avoid taking this. I feel like plus 10% crit chance isn't worth it because this may just lose you fight outright at a critical moment. Really something you don't want to have. So I would avoid taking this at all costs. However, this talent here, 10 impact for 10 precision, actually very solid because you have a lot of precision you can just kind of catch up with using the agility here because agility gives you free uh, precision per level, very solid stuff, uh, I'll always just kind of take this, so instead of taking plus 15 precision minus impact, I'll just go for this, because you have quite a decent bunch of precision, you can make up for this loss by just pumping 5 points into agility, the moment you get this actually, and you will be pretty much okay. Now as far as the passives go, intelligence is a no brainer here, I would never take these, because you barely ever use the basic attacks, so there is no real point in taking these. And then you take Intelligence again, you should be done with this tree more or less. I did in the end, I think, uh, and end up taking the Magic Step just to improve my dodge a little bit. And this is these two abilities, very powerful, I would go with this first because this is like your bread and butter once you get it. There's really no stopping you. And level 10 you take the Jaruk's Death Snake, which is again very strong, 200% base damage, very large range. Also ignores line of sight, so you can, t you can target basically anybody with it, right? So it's kind of a strong ability. Now the wizard just has accuracy issues, and the thing is, the only ability that actually uses accuracy is the major fireball and the basic attacks she has, because all these abilities are guaranteed to hit. So you don't really need that much agility. If you're feeling if you're feeling frisky, you can just go like kind of a little bit into agility and just kind of invest into intelligence. Like I would just always, I think, at the early stages of the game, I think I went like for the first few levels. I just, I think I maxed out intelligence. And then when I picked up this talent, I kind of tried to make up for this minus 10 precision just by getting some extra agility because your intelligence does give you accuracy as well. So this is not that bad. Obviously Fireball, not that accurate at first, but you have so many bonuses. Once you unlock it, you have access to plus what? Plus 20 accuracy, plus 20 precision altogether. So you don't need that much agility overall. You just kind of need to make a make up for the loss here. And that's basically all you really need. And then you can just kind of go all in on intelligence, really. Nothing is stopping you from doing this. And then you just end up with extremely powerful attacks that just obliterate your enemies. The most powerful character in the game by far, I think. And this is the build I was using, and she was just excellent and very well-rounded character as well. She just does everything extremely well. I would say this is the build to go. I ignored Constitution altogether. I feel like you can just keep her safe, keep her in the back line, and she'll be just doing her job. You really do not want to miss out on accuracy and damage anyway, so she is just a full glass cannon, just like the thief, just like the elf, and she does her job extremely well. So that's the way to build your, your wizards, I think. And now the Paladin, and she's one of those characters that really do benefit from all the reset she can get, because she will have a, several kind of build phases. I think she's like one of the most complex characters to build overall, because she has like several stages at which she works. So first of all, she'll be your main tank when she gets her, because she's just the most resilient one alongside the Dwarf. Despite rather low HP people, she'll just be very, very big in terms of the defenses, because she can just drop their lawful retaliation very early on into basically every encounter and she just crit parry every single attack that you know is thrown at her. So I'd always take the lawful retaliation on your paladin, I would always take the Jad Jadish Sakur as well. If you have the uh, bonus um, the bonus uh, action available to yourself, you can probably just pop these two abilities at the very start of the fight, you can't really go wrong with this. 
And this means you have like a lot of parry, a lot of protection across the board for your allies as well. Very big setup early on. Hammer of Justice on the other hand. One of those abilities that are indeed guaranteed to hit. Very important because this allows you to actually just stun your target reliably. Very good stuff. Uh, now, parry, something that you really need to have on your paladin. She is a parry master, so you really want to maximize the parry first. Now, this is not that bad, actually. When I think about it, you know, taking the extra stamina, not really that useful. Taking fizz resistance early on, not, not that useful as well. So depending on what you're fighting, you'll benefit from the resets a lot if you just take this one first. Because, you know, this is very little at first. This doesn't give you that much. Level 4 is going to be like, like plus, plus 8 resistance. Not that good at all. Once you evolve your character, however, you really want to unlock both these points, right? So kind of keep this in mind. When you get where you get to like level five, level six, level seven, or at that point you will be getting stunned and frozen and burned and poisoned and knocked down a lot. And this is the point at which you want to reset and just kind of invest a lot into these two abilities because this just gives you a lot of, of bonuses. Now, I kind of went the lesser, less lethal hammer of justice against spellcasters, demons, undead. You don't really need that many of them in the game, really. So I feel like this was a kind of a waste. And you have to remember, you can reset every time, so you can just kind of adjust your build depending on what you're facing. So if you're fi you are fighting dwarves, or so you're fighting like orcs and goblins on a floor, you should always just kind of respec into this, and then you can just respec into this when you're fighting demons, right? So you can kind of be switching your builds around a lot. I feel this is fine as well, you should just be kind of flexible, you should not be afraid to kind of make those alterations. This does up your damage, so this probably is worth taking overall as well. Now, this is the point at which you unlock probably the most powerful skill that the, pal that the Paladin can ever have, and you should obviously be using this. This is the Sword of Justice, this I think does about 350% baseline damage, and this does require you to set up, this does require you to sacrifice your two turns, and to kind of set it up properly. So this will probably be the moment at which you start considering the reset, because your parry bonus when you get here isn't that big anymore. So you might want to kind of switch out from the kind of tanky setup to this more damage focused setup here. And obviously this will pay dividends if you do it right. So this setup means that you get a lot of, you need to have like the first card, you need to go first into every single fight with your Paladin. So you need to probably invest a little bit into courage. So once you pick this one up, you probably want to take like two, three points into courage. You want to get like some rings that give you courage or amulets that give you courage, uh, armor pieces that give you courage, anything that allows you to go sooner than the first enemy. And this allows you to just burst down bosses in a single turn. This ability just does more than any other characters is capable of doing at this stage of the game. Because this is tier three and you have this very, very powerful channel already available to you. So how you play it is, when you start with the Paladin, you do not do anything, you just wait, you delay your turn, you go to the very end of the turn, and when you are at the very end of the turn, you start channeling the Sword of Justice. And this means that like, at the very beginning of the next turn, unless you were stunned somewhere in the middle, uh, you just unleash the Sword of Justice on any target you may want. You can snipe down archers, you can snipe down enemy mages, this ability can do up to 200 damage when you're maxed out. Very, very potent skill overall. I'll always take this. This was kind of my bread and butter anyway. I feel like this is just super strong. You should always pick this one up. Now, I was using the sucker. I leveled up the sucker here. But I feel like at this point, it starts becoming kind of underwhelming. So if you are into this, like in, at this stage of the game, you probably might want to reset this again at some point and reinvest these points into this. Strength of the Righteous allows you to buff, to buff up your Barbarian or your Thief to kind of allow them to do a lot of damage overall. So I think you might just kind of want to reset at this point, kind of redo your build once you are, you, once you are around level 6. So I'm just going to add the points as if you're level 6 as is, and at that point we'll be just kind of rebuilding this a little bit, okay? So this is probably what you are aiming, at level, aiming for at level 6, but at this point you want to reset and kind of change your spec a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of add the points before we do this. So let's say we're going for the classic. I was going like 1-1 one, one up until this point. So when I was level 5, I had like a lot of constitution and agility, nothing else really. So uh, how many points? I think this is it, right? We, we added like, uh, I think, yeah, this this should be like level uh, no, level 6. So that's not exactly that. Uh, so I started, like, I started going 1-1-1 one, 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 uh, when I started getting like plus 3 points. And when we are level 6, uh, we just say okay so we're level six now we're gonna reset again so we use our elixir of oblivion and we go back to our baseline stats and we just kind of rebuild this character from the bottom and we ignore certain uh, elements of the build so honestly i would go for six parry here you really don't need these abilities so probably actually taking one level of um, of actually retaliation isn't that bad then i actually didn't notice this before but you don't need this so 
uh, you don't need this for sure at this point, right? So you go for additional parry. It's always good to have it, really. There's no reason not to have parry. Uh, you go for uh, the bonus physical resistance. Uh, you might want to pick up uh, the one of those hammers, depending on what you're fighting. I would go for ogres and sorry for orcs, uh, trolls, and goblins because you are fighting a lot of those guys. And again, this one uh, is a good idea. We take this. We start building towards the strength of the righteous and the charge of justice. So you totally ignore this. Because Charge of Justice is quite strong as well, it does a lot of damage once you kind of improve it. And it just does very, very decent uh, movement for you as well, so it's kind of an altogether very decent skill. So I would probably take the Charge here, maybe even this, uh, it's up to you entirely like what you want to be doing, like, depends on your playstyle really. This is not that bad, like once you get it to level 2 and level 3 it's just going to kind of pay dividends in the end. We take this bonus here, this gives, uh, gives us a lot of magical resistance again. And you can probably take the charge as well. The aroma isn't that great. I feel like this is just kind of a wasted point. This again, just heavy damage. You really don't need this at all. So I would just take the charge here. And now you can choose between the kill that gives you stamina back or just the sword of justice baseline, which knocks enemies over. Or you can also go for the divine barbecue, which I actually prefer because it just does a lot for you. You have like, you need to, you need to spend five points. So you have to be smart about this. There's a decent AOE attack that just does a lot. So I just go for this. I would go for this. Uh, we'll probably run out of points. We probably are not going to be able to take uh, like the fourth charge of justice here So I, I went for knock over with this because if it doesn't kill you it gives you a knockdown That's pretty decent. I think taking this is pretty solid choice as well as far as the passives Then I feel like taking the bonus to max HP is a very solid choice uh, It just kind of allows you to you know scale up your health a little bit at the very least it means that you are staying alive for a bit longer in those fights now, plus two courage, obviously a very good choice, right? Because you are going to go first then, and you want to kind of keep this in mind when you're improving your character here, you really want to kind of invest a lot into courage overall. So this is kind of a way of doing this as well, kind of improves your character a little bit. And then you have quite a few things you can do. So uh, for instance, when you when you do this, you could go for the, for the stamina whenever you're below 50% HP. You can go for, uh, this is not, not that great. I actually tried this out, this wasn't that cool at all. Uh, you can go for like bonus damage against demons or you know if you're trying to kind of keep your character kind of uh, flexible uh, that's basically gonna be it and then you have a choice between one of these two skills really you can go for the strength of the righteous which will buff up your target's damage this can go on the barbarian as well this will make him extremely potent or onto a thief again or onto the ogre or onto the wizard that's kind, kind of allows you to find a lot of power when you have nothing better to do with your character I feel like this is a very strong skill, so just max it out. And voila, here is your full build. What you could also do is you kind of can skip this. I think you can just kind of over invest into passives at some point and just skip this ability altogether. This allows you to take additional charge of justice as well. So this being said, uh, our base build, like once, once we kind of start improving or making those alterations, you do not really need that much agility here because you have a 100% chance to hit with every single of those abilities. So I think you can just kind of invest into strength and constitution then really no problem there. Obviously parry is a good mechanic but you really don't need this that much. So I just always go like with this kind of high damage paladin, this kind of an, a style that I would pick in the end. I think this is gonna work very well. You can obviously stick to, you can obviously stick to your previous kind of tank style as well. So you can kind of max out the the sucker and just kind of go slow with the paladin, but really there is no need for that. So it kind of, you know, diversify here between strength and constitution. Maybe just max out strength at some point, you know, just go up to like 30 strength, 20 constitution. Um, oh, we, no, they're right. We need like four points into courage as well. So I'm just gonna uh, just go like this. This should probably be your final stat distribution, right? So 14, seven and six, this kind of looks quite decent. Obviously this uh, involves um, your two courage here bonus from uh, from try me as well this is something i'd probably say is the ultimate set of the paladin because she just can transition to being another damage dealer later on into the game because it just speeds you up a little bit just gives you a little bit of oomph and you kind of want to have that so obviously you can stick to this previous tank style you know just maximizing the sucker here and just going with this i don't think this is necessary though because i have really been using sword of justice almost exclusively uh, at the start of every fight, almost every fight, and it was doing me really a huge, huge favor. Just buffing, you know, allowing you to kind of take down a single opponent very early into every single fight just is extremely meaningful. And, you know, you don't really use that many basic attacks with your Paladin, so getting that much agility later doesn't make sense. Early on, obviously, just invest into it, because this is like your, your lifeline, you know, having a lot of parry is good, but at the point at which you kind of go beyond level... 
uh, be on level 6, it doesn't really matter anymore, you just kind of want to diversify here. Maybe get some stamina regeneration from gear, so that you kind of get a lot of energy to kind of, you know, fuel all those abilities. Right, that's kind of what I would do anyway. So that's, that's the second build that you kind of have to transition into later. This is going to be extremely powerful, I think. This is just going to give you a lot uh, of power, and it just allows you to kind of make your characters stronger overall. So, yeah, that's it, guys, for the Paladin. So thank you guys for bearing with me for this entire long video. If you read this point, kudos to you. Thank you for watching. Remember, if you haven't followed and subscribed yet, please do this now. Thank you to all my supporters as well. The list should be rolling down right now. Guys, you're amazing. Thank you for supporting me, uh, supporting me with real life money. It's just kind of amazing. I have really never expected this to be the case uh, with you know my YouTube uh, gig. Uh, guys, stay tuned for more. Uh, I think this might be the final thing I do on the Dungeon of Nahalbuk. If you have any more requests for the game, please remember to comment and let me know what you think. Also, if you have like some criticism of the builds that I'm proposing here, you can also post it below. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay tuned for more. See you around.